don't, uh, uh, I think it's pretty obvious we've been under opposition today. The lights aren't working, but those are in the process of being fixed, and that's getting done. Ivan's in the back room in his bed, sick. Um, and Leslie was unable to come, and it's just, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that except to say we need to pray. We need to pray for one another because we are under opposition, and we'll check on Carolyn in a little while. Um, God is amazing, and even in the midst of opposition, God is still amazing. Um, and, and if we get a hold of nothing else today, I pray that we can get a hold of the goodness of God, no matter what it looks like, no matter what it looks like. Um, and so I, I call myself blessed, and I'm just going to go ahead and call you blessed, and by the end of this message, we'll get there to where we really understand how blessed we are. Um, the, the message I originally wrote disappeared into cyberspace, my laptop malfunctioned, um, and immediately I thought about, oh, I see Carolyn's car. Hey, hallelujah. Yay. <laughs> immediately, I was like, now what? <laughs> because I pray over the message. I, I type an outline on Monday morning, and then on, for the rest of the week, I continue to pray over it and add the scriptures. And I started typing, almost joking, that I'm going to just ditch that message and, and talk about the opposite of opposition. And just as I said that, I got a text from Nick talking about opposition. <laughs> You know, all throughout the kingdom of God, God is speaking to his people today. And he's healing. And he's offering comfort and hope. And he's, you don't have to yank it shut, Carolyn. Thank you. Good morning, you had us worried. Are you okay? <laughs> Amen. Carolyn is, I... I, I never, I, I should just put it on a revolving disc so we can see how beautiful it is from every angle. I wouldn't believe that. I would believe it. The roses from her garden. Sorry, so sorry. That's all right. So, I had a message about seeking the will of God, and it disappeared, and then I made a decision to talk about opposition. Apparently, it was God's will that I preach a different message, we could say that I'm under opposition. Just for the record, I'm opposed to opposition. <laughs> but trials do come, and we can only choose how to respond to that opposition. I could list all my other woes and sorrows for this week and hardships that came before and after all that happened and before my back went out. I'm going to spare you, and I, I owe apologies to anyone who I didn't spare from my list of woes and complaints. During the song, um, From My Mother's Womb, You Have Chosen Me, I, one of my aggravations this week was my sisters were all talking about what are we going to do with our mother's ashes, and I had some kind of negative ideas about that, but God reminded me in that song, I chose you from your mother's womb. Hallelujah. And he has brought me into his family. So how can I feel like I was somehow overlooked? How can I be better about anything in light of what God has done for me? They say a, a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down, but pain is hard for anyone to swallow. Physical pain makes everything else a little more difficult, whether it's your pain or whether someone you love is hurting. Pain is hard to swallow. And most of us know how to quote James 1, 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Most of us know how to quote it. But it's far easier to quote that than to accomplish it. And just as a side note here, God does require those who preach to practice what they preach. We're told that teachers are held to a higher standard. I believe that when we quote scripture, we should also be careful about never quoting scripture in a light or in a cliche manner because the same words 
that you quote will echo in your spirit when you're faced with your own circumstances. If you're hurting and I say, well, count it all joy, I need to be prepared to have that same attitude when I'm hurting. And, and that's just a side note. So, Father, I'm just coming before you. Thank you. Lord, as one of your chosen people, ready to be molded, to be clay in your hands, to seek your face and your perfect will for our lives, and not to let the voice of the enemy deter us from the prize, from the calling that we all here have in you, in Christ Jesus. Help us today to better understand how to face opposition, I pray. And Father, I pray for Ivan, who's sick in the back room. I pray for all those, for Leslie, who tried to be here today. And I know that you are intervening in the heavenlies on their behalf. So we thank you, Lord, that you hear us. In Jesus' name, we pray. <coughs> Amen. If opposition is defined in the dictionary, and it is defined as resistance expressed in anger or negative action. Resistance expressed in anger or negative action. Then the opposite of that, of that the opposite of resistance is cooperation expressed in positive action expressed in positive action. Who are we cooperating with? We're co-laborers with Christ. And sometimes we explain opposition by saying, well, the devil's mad at me because, and then we add whatever thing we think we've accomplished. <laughs> and that fits into that dictionary definition of opposition. Anger. Negative action. But is it in Scripture? Yeah, it really is. In 1 Peter 5 8, it says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Of course, not all of our opposition is authored by the enemy. The main thing is that we be alert and of sober mind. And that sounds more like, like more than hunger and driven by anger, hunger to devour, anger. And I guess that's what they call hangry <laughs> in the world. But it really is no laughing matter. Evil seeks to kill and destroy. So we have to make a conscious decision to turn the tide of opposition and take a stand against the plots of the enemy. There's no better way to turn the tables on Satan than by quoting scripture. Quoting scripture and believing it. Quoting scripture in faith and in sincerity. That's how Jesus dealt with him. And I love it when we see Jesus quote scripture, the very word of God speaking the word of God. And there's something so powerful in the delivery when he is quoting, when he is quoting it. And even when opposition becomes that horrible, uninvited guest that you think is never going to leave, God gives us the gift of grace to endure. He equips us throughout Scripture and by His Holy Spirit for every trial, for every attack of the enemy. Once you set your mind to see with the eyes of faith, you become free. You become free of that opposition. In Matthew 7, 11, it says, If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Sometimes we get stuck in a place of self-pity. We forget <coughs> to ask. And we take everything that happens personally as if we're being targeted by God. We get so focused on the trouble, we forget about the arsenal of weapons that we have been given. Ephesians 6.16 says, In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Some translations say fiery darts. Fire indicates 
burn. And that hurts. <laughs> Self-pity leads to doubt. And doubt is designed to weaken us. Doubting God destroys our faith and it leads to utter despair, to disappointment. Doubt is actually the opposite of faith. And we begin to question God or even doubt ourselves. Did I do something wrong? Is God punishing me for some unconfessed sin? From the place of self-pity, we are blind to the gifts we've been given to face opposition and come through victorious. We overlook the positive actions that God is taking on our behalf and already took on our behalf. Daniel was a man of God, a visionary, a prophet. He was rescued from the mouth of lions. In Daniel chapter 10, we read about a spiritual battle that Daniel endured, one of the many spiritual battles that he endured. In Daniel chapter 10, and I'm going to read a few verses here. Daniel 10, starting in verse 12, it says, Then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard. And I have come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. And then in verse 14 it says, Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision refers to many days yet to come. We are his people in the latter days. How is it then that we tend to think in selfish terms concerning opposition when we know that the most important gift of God is life itself? The worst thing that can happen to us is dying without knowing him. The gift of salvation of eternal life, the gift of repentance which leads to salvation, the gift of the Holy Spirit which enables us to receive Christ as Savior and to be set free from sin and death. Should we then question the rest of God's gifts? Think of the best gift you've ever gotten, you have ever received. Think of even in light of that gift, it pales in comparison to what God has given us. I'm thinking of the worst gift, too. Anybody ever get that Billy the Big Mouth Bass plaque with a rubber fish singing, Don't Worry, Be Happy? <laughs> For Christmas. Now, some people may think that's a great gift. Wouldn't, wouldn't impress me. Do we think repentance the gift of repentance is a time-limited offer. Sorry, that coupon expired. One day only sale. And does God ever give gifts begrudgingly or out of a sense of duty? God's gifts come from a place of pure and sacrificial love. Romans 11.20, excuse me, 11.29 says, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. We often quote that talking about specific ministry calling. But I'm reading what it says. It says the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. That was the King James Version. The New King James Version says the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And the Amplified Bible says, For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable, bull, for he does not withdraw what he has given, nor does he change his mind about those to whom he gives his grace or to whom he sends his call. Amen. I remember the Oprah Winfrey show. It was, and she had a show, an annual show that was the most popular show she ever did, and it was her favorite things day. Oh, yeah. She'd talk about all these expensive things that she thought were necessities, like a $500 jar of face cream. Oh, you have to have this. <laughs> you have to. And then she would, like, 
Um, and, and obviously, these gifts were sponsored. Yeah. But she took credit for being generous. Most people can't afford a $500 jar of face cream. And then she would say, look under your chair, there's one for every one of you. And everybody would clap, and adore Oprah. And then she had to keep getting bigger and more sensational gifts. And how fun would it be to lavish gifts on the people we love, making us seem like the hero, the benefactor, the most generous person of all time. When Pastor Paul and I would minister to homeless to people who were down and out, who were hungry. We had to be so careful that they understood that this love comes from Jesus. We're not special. It's about Him. It's about Him. Have you ever dreamed of winning enough money to surprise a loved one with a new car or pay off their mortgage? I have. My father never in his entire life drove a new car. And I would have loved to have given him one. That alabaster box that we know about, it contained expensive perfumed oils, but that isn't the part that's remembered. It was Mary's passion, her gratitude for Jesus, her understanding of who he was that prompted the gift and the way it was so humbly offered, washing his feet with her drying her tears with her hair, the way she understood that he was about to be sacrificed and buried. That is what we remember. Yeah. And why he said it would always be remembered. We have these spiritual essentials and must-haves that we sometimes leave on the shelf or saving it for later or buried beneath our sorrows or our disappointments. No gift on earth can match the cost or value of what Jesus paid for us. We know that. We know it. And yet it's still difficult to comprehend. And we sometimes forget that it can't be taken from us. We can only give it away or reject it. God forbid. The gifts of God without repentance, not to be revoked or withdrawn, and not to be regretted. No regrets concerning the gifts of God. The prophet Joel said in Joel 2.28, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and, you, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And Peter quoted the prophet Joel in Acts 2.17, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Peter was quoting that in his sermon to the crowd who had just witnessed the giving of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then down in Acts 2.38, it says, And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. My goodness, this is a scripture that some religions like to turn into. I'm not sure what they're trying to turn it into. Anything but a gift for all. A promise for all. I just want to point out here, if you remember what was happening, how all different foreigners, all different nations, all different people, all different faiths, all different religions, all different traditions were witnessing the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on that day, the speaking in other tongues, different races, different religions, different creeds, were all there hearing the words of that promise. If God has called you, anyone, to himself through the Holy Spirit, we should put it in our hearts to discover him and comprehend that he is God and that gift is for us. That gift is for every, every believer. We don't 
hold out a life raft or a life preserve and say, here, got a present for you. Do you want it? <laughs> we say, grab this and hold on. And I know I'm treading on some controversial religious issues and sacred cows, but the only things that are truly sacred are those that are made sacred by him. And if there's anything sacred left on this sin-stressed planet, it is the gifts of God that are without apology, without repentance. Good gifts. Good gifts. Galatians 5.22 says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Scriptures are life preservers that we can grab onto. It says submit yourselves then to God. Submit is another way of saying cooperate to God. With God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Those are words of life concerning opposition. Twofold action, submitting to God and resisting the devil. Galatians 5.5 5 says, But by faith we eagerly await through the Spirit the hope of righteousness. What a gift. Righteousness. The gift that Jesus gave us, imparted to us. Yeah. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. All that matters is faith expressed through love. Righteousness imparted to us through faith in Jesus in a measurable gift. Grab on, hold on. It's a life preserver. You ever feel these days like we're drowning? As a nation, as a people, as church, as the, the world is in chaos. We've got life preservers all throughout Scripture. Galatians 5.13 says, For you, brothers, were called to freedom. But do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Rather, serve one another in love. There's such value. There's such joy. There's there's healing that comes through serving one another. The entire law, it says in verse 14, is fulfilled in a single decree. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then verse 15 says, but if you keep on biting and devouring one another, hmm, there's that word devour. Uh -huh. Watch out or you will be consumed by one another. We will be consumed by the assignments of the enemy, by that opposition. Let's not allow opposition to consume us. Freely he gave, we can freely give in a world plagued by opposition, brother against brother. We have a limitless storehouse of gifts yes. we can access and we can share. Gifts that cost us nothing. You can give it away, give it away, give it away. And there's a constant replenishment. Yeah. It cost him everything. It cost us nothing. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Don't let disappointment or failed dreams or troubles, financial hardship, bad experiences, fear, sickness take root and destroy hope regardless of how bad it seems. The disciples watched him die after leaving everything and everyone they loved to follow him. They were hiding out in fear for their lives, but he appeared to them and he told them to go to Jerusalem and wait for a gift. They went to that upper room and waited for the promised gift that would empower them to impact the entire world and the future of that world, despite the opposition that they endured. And finally, the Apostle Paul prayed that we would receive power. In Ephesians 1, and this, Pastor Paul knows what I'm going to quote right here. It's one of his favorite prayers that he prays daily. 
that he has encouraged us to pray over our community here. Ephesians 1, verses 15 through 23, it says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. But the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, and what are the riches of his glory, and his inheritance in the state, in the saints, our inheritance. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principalities and power and might and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. We need to view opposition in light of the power that is available to us, the gift of the Holy Spirit. In verse 22 it says, He put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. We're the church. This is the church, which is his body and the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is a relatively short message, shorter than I usually give. Oppose the opposition by the word of our testimony and the gift of the Holy Spirit. See every life preserver that is thrown to us and throw out life preservers to other, not in a cliche, not in a way that we just recite these scriptures that we know so well, from our heart as a gift to uplift one another, to uphold one another, to pray for one another, to bear each other's burdens, the ones that are too heavy for us to carry alone. Oppose the opposition. Oppose it, don't let it. If you grab onto that, you drown. You drown in fear in sorrow. I've made up my mind. I don't know whether my back will be healed tomorrow. I believe in the prayers Carolyn prayed, and the prayer Nick prayed, and my husband prayers, and, 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 and June's prayer, and uplifted, and, and Deborah's prayer this morning, all the prayers that have been prayed for me, I believe those prayers, and those prayers are particularly special to me, because I know they were prayed in faith and in love. And some of them came with, with gifts of beauty, beauty that reminds us of the good, of the good gifts that we can cling to. I've made up my mind to oppose the opposition. I don't know if it's going to be healed tomorrow. I don't know how long it's going to take, but I know that I refuse to let the opposition drown me in self-pity and in sorrow. It stop us from the goal, the prize, the calling that we have here in McKinleyville through this church. So just keep praying. Amen. Keep believing. I think that's enough for this morning.